Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we cordially invite you to be ready because in the few minutes, the international conference will proceed with no time. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Respectable Chairman of Rektor Universitas Nasional, Dr. El Amri Bermawi Putra, MA. Respectable Vice Chancellor of Universitas Nasional, Professor Dr. Eko Sugianto, MSI. Honorable the Organizing Committee, Dr. Insinyur Nanon Saribanan, MSI, and Honorable all the speakers and participants. Good morning, dear ladies and gentlemen. From Jakarta, Indonesia, Wednesday, 6 July 2022. On this lovely morning, I would like to come all participants in the opening ceremony of the first international conference on natural product and chronic disease 2022. Before we start the next agenda, let's watch the video workshop at Harimun and Samota. Thank you. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, step on the following agenda or speech, the first conference report by organizing committee, Dr. Insinyur Nanon Saribanon, MSE. Ms. Nanon, the time is yours. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to extend my gratitude to all the honorable attendees of the conference, the distinguished rector of Universitas Nasional, Dr. El Amri Bermawi Putra, who is unable to attend the opening speech. So that the speech will be represented by Professor Dr. Eko Sugianto as Vice Rector, and I would like to welcome to the Honorable Vice Rectors of Universitas Nasional, Professor Dr. Ernawati Sinaga, 
and Professor Dr. Eko Sugianto, and also the Honorable Dean of Pharmacy Faculty of Universitas Pancasila, Professor Dr. Samsudin Abdullah, uh, and also I would like to welcome the distinguished Professor Dr. Ilya Raskin and uh, as a director of CBCD Rutgers University and also the Honorable Professor Dr. Vyaseslav Dusenko uh, as associate director of CBCD Rutgers University and uh, I think also the staff uh, Ms. Isabel Armas and Antonia Kass welcome to uh, our campus and uh, also I would like to thank to uh, the CBDCs and owners and also Universal Pancasila that giving me the opportunity to be uh, the organizing committee of this conference. And I would like to uh, give the report of this conference uh, and on behalf of the organizing committee, we are pleased to announce that the first international conference on natural products and chronic diseases 2022 will commence today, 6th of July 2022, on both offline and online platform conference. And I would like to welcome the Honorable Professor Dr. Ilya Raskin from Rutgers University, New Jersey, United States, as keynote speaker for the conference. And we are also welcoming and would as well gladly welcome our invited speakers. The first is uh, Professor Ernawati Sinaga from Universitas Nasional Indonesia. And the next is Professor Samsudin Abdullah from Universitas Pancasila Indonesia. And also a uh, warm welcome is also given to Professor Sebek Satoru from Avicenna Tajik State Medical University, Tajikistan, <coughs> who is going to attend uh, by online. And we would also welcome Dr. Muhammad Ajmal Sab from Hazara University, Mansara, Pakistan, but unfortunately he has to be taken care of at the hospital right now uh, and due to illness and that we hope that we will get healthy soon. And uh, we are welcoming also Professor Dr. Andang Sukara from Universal National and also from IUP, the uh, Indonesian Academy for Science. And Professor Hamza Suryati Binti Muhammad from University Sultan Zainal Abidin, Malaysia. She is also joining us by online. And uh, this conference, International Conference on Natural Products and Chronic Diseases, is an event that is conducted in collaboration of Universitas Nasional, Universitas Pancasila, and Center for Botanical and Chronic Diseases of Rajas University. ICNCD, uh, we pronounce it as ICNCD, is the premier interdisciplinary forum for life scientists, engineers, and practitioners to present their latest research results, ideas, developments, and application in all areas of sustainable development goals or SDGs, especially, especially on the area of environmental and health issues. The conference will bring leading academic scientists and researchers and also scholars together. And last but not least, we are welcoming the 25 speakers and 2015 participants, both online and offline who will attend the plenary session and also parallel session of this conference. And we would like, uh, we would hopefully expect everyone to gain benefits from this conference. And this conference can become an insight for all scholars and academic members to continue research, 
researching many ideas on how to generate innovation for sustainable future. And I would like to apologize for any inconveniences occurring in this conference. And from Universitas Nacional Jakarta, I would wish you to enjoy this conference and thank you very much for your kind participation. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Mrs. Nanan, for the speech. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the second speech and opening the conference today will be delivered by your respectable vice Chancellor of Universitas Nacional, Professor Dr. Eko Sugianto, MSE. For, me, for Prof. Eko, the time is yours. Uh, sorry, director cannot add an end. I represent him. Good morning, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Ladies and gentlemen, please and please this is the call upon the Almighty for his blessing so that we can gather here to hold the first international conference on natural product and chronic diseases 2022. I would like also to thank uh, all guests, speaker and participant to this special edition and in this spirit, I should like to extend a very warm welcome you all to the online and offline conference to today. This international conference on natural product and chronic diseases is a collaboration between UNTAS National, UNTAS Pancasila, and then Biological Science. Roger, the State University of New Jersey. We are proud to announce that this collaboration has entered its second year of partnership, and we do hope it will continue to develop and make huge contribution to quality of life, good health, and community well-being. This conference will bring together leading academic scientists, scientists researchers, and scholars, and allow it to welcome Prof. Dr. Eya Raskin, Raja University, USA, and then Prof. Dr. Ena Sinaga, MSc, University National Indonesia, Prof. Samsudin. Just Pancasila, Indonesia. Prof. Serbuk Satur, Tajikistan. Dr. Muhammad Akmal Shah, Pakistan. And then Prof. Matia Hamsah Suyati from Malaysia. ICNCD aim to fight of provide a platform from academician, researcher, student, and participation, and uh, to continually develop strong research culture and share experiences and research output on various aspects. With regard to natural product and horic diseases, it is our hope that such an interdisciplinary forum will 
be able to address operating challenge and seek solution our well-being as well as more meaningful and higher quality of life. I would like to be able to say that purely scientific action will continue because I believe it is in our national interest and the interest of humanity. Thank you. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Prof. Eko, for the speech. And ladies and gentlemen, in the next agenda is awarding of certificate to trainee from Universitas Nasional who have complete the capacity building program for researcher MS program support and mentor by International Research Training Center for Botanicals and Chronic Disease in collaboration with Rogers University and Universitas Nasional. We present Alvira Nur Effendi, Rina Trivani, Bunga Anggrai Nisari, and to Prof. Ilya Raskin as Director of the Center for Botanicals and Chronic Disease Rogers University, accompanied by Prof. Ernawati Sinaga from Universitas Nasional, Prof. Syamsuddin from Universitas Pancasila, and Prof. Eko Sugianto as the Vice Chancellor of Universitas Nasional, and Prof. Vyacheslav Dunskov. Please take the floor.
Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the next agenda is speech from keynote speaker, Professor Ilya Raskin as director of Center for Botanicals and Chronic Disease, Rajas University. For Prof. Ilya Raskin, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I guess everybody can hear me. And I'm just absolutely honored to be here. I'm very, very grateful to all my friends and colleagues in Indonesia who organized our wonderful trip here, organized this conference, organized the workshop, uh, organized the students' presentation, uh, particularly our dear friend and colleague, Professor Orson Naga. Uh, and, and, and all, all the other, other friends, friends. And there's so many already which remain so thank you all it's a pleasure to be here and i think i'm saying it not just for myself but on behalf of my colleagues who also had the pleasure and privilege of coming coming here and visiting your wonderful country and the wonderful universities if i may have my first slide please um, yes. Okay, so this is how, okay. all right. Uh, maybe we don't need me, maybe we just need the slides, but that's okay. So we just can see the slides better, uh, if that's possible. Okay, we can just make a, a, a full screen of a slide. Oh, no, the first slide's okay, let's just go there. Right, so, uh, well, I was asked to talk about the uh, future of research on, on botanicals and botanical medicines. And truly, what I should have done is just stop on this slide because the future of this research is shown on the slide. I'm just giving you some thoughts. Some of them may be right, some of them may be wrong. But the future is in our, is the younger generations and the, okay, it doesn't, in the students and trainees from Indonesia and Tajikistan the young generation of scientists from uh, Indonesian universities who will eventually become researchers in these countries and will be defining the future of this area. So what I'm going to be talking about is just my ideas. So we can move to the next slide, please. And if possible, make it full screen. Again, just the slide, but if not, it's okay. Uh, right. Well, anyhow. So why plants? Why is it an important area? And of course, all of us know this is not new to us. The people always equated plants with health, with well-being, with their functional foods, with everything good around them. And of course, this is because plants produce this vast array of natural products, as we call them, secondary metabolites, which are optimized for biological function, which are designed to work together um, and which really represent uh, thousands and thousands of major compounds. Actually, a single green plant, a plant we often step on without noticing, can produce and contain more chemicals, uh, biochemicals, than a man-built chemical plants can produce. It's a remarkable accomplishment of plants. Next slide, please. Why do plants do this and if you really think that one of the crucial difference between plants and animals is that animals protect themselves and they communicate through basically sound and the energy which animals produce mainly from plants goes to support muscles brain and digestion uh, they run from danger uh, they run from cold Muscles are very important. This is where all the energy go. But plants are anchored in one place. They are what we call sessile organisms. They cannot move. They cannot run away. They cannot escape. And that's why they really concentrate uh, all their resources into communicating uh, and doing business through chemistry by making this vast array of what we call natural products. 
Um, in, so everything is goes into chemical synthesis. That's why plants are such a wonderful resources of phytochemicals, not animals, which consume plants often to get the phytochemicals. Thank you so much. Next slide, please. And move, move to the, yeah. So in a way, the evolution of plants um, became a biochemical evolution because only through biochemistry, plants can evolve and survive and counteract multiple diseases, uh, stresses which they encounter, rain, wetness, sunlight, UV, they do it all through chemistry. Next one, please. Next slide, please. Right, so, and as we know, people knew these characteristics of plant for centuries. Therefore, from the very dawn of human civilizations, plants have been used as medicines. And this is just a, a figure from our rather old publication from 2002, uh, which lists the most important pharmaceuticals which came from plants, which are used by billions of people and saved millions and billions of lives. Alkaloids, as you know, nitrogen containing compounds represent probably the most pharmacologically important group of plant natural products, secondary metabolites. Uh, terpenoids and steroids are very important there. Artemisinin obviously is, is in this group. Uh, for five years ago, Nobel Prize was awarded for actually uh, discovery of artemisinin by a Chinese team. Uh, and then the phenolics and some other mixture. So uh, tremendous contribution to human health and despite the fact that pharmaceutical industry is moving away from single compounds into biologics, vaccines, gene therapy, still about a quarter of pharmaceuticals, which you can get from your uh, physician, your doctor, come from plants. And of course, traditional medicine, traditional healers use them almost exclusively. Next slide, please. I think what is also very important and unique about plants is there's so much energy going to the chemical synthesis uh, and it's so expensive for a plant to make the natural products that they don't make them all the, they don't make all the chemicals they can all the time. So they became this chemical chameleons, biochemical chameleons, which sense the environment and respond to this different stresses they encounter by producing different phytochemicals. So that's why if you harvest a plant in different times, you will not always get the same biochemical profile. Some of you know, and traditional medicine knows, Sometimes not only which plant to collect, but which parts to collect, at what season to collect, even of what time of the day to collect, because those chemical chameleons are in tune with the environment and they change their biochemical composition all the time. Next slide, please. So what I wanted to um, talk a little bit about how plants evolve this remarkable ability to make so many valuable natural products. And really we didn't know till recently because most of the research on actually how those complex pathways evolved uh, for making the extra probe, which has been uncovered very recently, actually last several years, a number of very good publications on the subject. And it is becoming very clear now what, what plants did, that basically the, the, the early, the, the, they're one of the first plants which existed, uh, they only have the primary metabolism, right? Primary metabolism is only the genes which, which uh, encode for enzymes, uh, which uh, make something which is essential for life. But during the process of evolution, those genes duplicated. So what was a primary metabolism gene made, had a copy. And now this copy was free to do whatever it wants. It was free to mutate without affecting the survival of organisms. And this became an, a, a process by which natural selection of, of, of uh, secondary metabolites evolved. So Rob Last, for example, showed at uh, Michigan State University, published several very important papers on the subject, where he showed that insulinaceous and nightshade family, uh, acyl sugars, which are important defense compound, and so uh, selenaceous plants can put acetyl groups on various, various part of the sugar molecule. And each of the stereospecific uh, reaction is catalyzed by a certain enzyme, but all of those enzymes evolved from the initial gene, which is encoded for basically sugar carbohydrate metabolism, very important. So through the duplication process. So at the end, those plants have many copies of the genes and those copies mutated, each one of them acquired a specific function. So we're starting to understand how plants do that. 
Um, next slide. And those are very important papers, I think. And then also in the last three years, uh, people became very excited about horizontal gene transfer, which apparently also helps plants and fungi and, and many organisms to acquire whole pathways for natural product biosynthesis. And the vectors, which for For example, move the parasite. For example, we recently learned from a nice article this year, actually, which I saw, uh, many distantly related fungi, uh, mushrooms, can make the same compound, which is very toxic, of course, as alpha amanitin. And apparently, it evolved uh, independently in different, very unrelated group of fungi through the vector transfer, some parasites or disease with vector which we haven't identified. Um, very fascinating. Uh, paper about actually the uh, genes from snakes and retroviruses from snakes got into their victims, actually their food, which are frogs. And you can see the same sequences somehow again from probably mutually uh, interesting parasitic organisms which evolved and so forth. And um, whitefly, which as you know, we know, all know is a big problem for growing anything in greenhouses. Apparently from plants have acquired the genes which can neutralize glucosides, which are very toxic, but plants don't get the toxicity because they can use melanyl transferases to put a melanyl residue on phenolaglucosides, detoxifying them. And the same gene pathway ended up in a white fly. Uh, fascinating paper, and that's why uh, white flies can, can eat those. Now, next one, please. Uh, and of course, uh, the way we elucidate the pathways for natural product synthesis changed dramatically in the omic era. When I was at the age of many of you and in graduate school, isolating genes and isolating enzymes responsible for natural product synthesis was a very laborious process because you had to you do extensive protein purification, almost isolate the enzyme to the purity, then prove using chemical reaction that they actually can convert one metabolite into another and so forth. Now it all completely changed in the, in the genomic era. And this is actually Sarah O'Connor have done a great job summarizing this recently uh, in the omic stage, because now we can just look at the whole transcriptomics of the plants. We can actually sequence very rapidly and inexpensively all the genes which are expressed in the plant at a given time. And through homology type analysis, or through tissue-specific analysis relating basically the tissues from which RNA comes to the presence of natural products, we can pretty well just after a very short time identify the genes responsible for the biosynthesis of a particular uh, natural product. And then we can, of course, take the gene, uh, uh, either um, do transform the organism, yeast and whatever, and actually very rapidly prove that this is the right enzyme. And so we can get the knowledge of very rapidly using spatial distribution, using expression pattern, identify through homology and through databases, identify the pathways for natural product biosynthesis almost from any plant. This is, omics have really contributed dramatically to, to the speed of this process, our understanding how and what makes this variety of natural products. Next one. And more importantly now, we can do it in a single cell. We can now sequence the transcriptomic DNA from a single cell. For example, we know that the root hair or trichomes of a plant where you have many natural products uh, contain natural metabolites, lots of them for defense. We can sequence a single cell by making a protoplast out of it. And actually this shows the uh, gene expressions and different cells, different tissues of the same plant. And you see how dramatically different that is. Most of the primary metabolism would be the same. So most of these differences in gene expression is due to the synthesis of natural products. And you can relate the presence of this natural product to a specific cell type and very rapidly sort of isolate the genes uh, which are identified genes which are responsible for this. This is enormously powerful and this is very new. And I think it will transform our ability to uh, study uh, natural products and plants. Next one. However, and, and so this was all good news, but, uh, and this is sort of my futuristic prediction already, 
what certainly we've seen that from 1990s, the interest in natural products, specifically for pharmaceuticals, for prescription drugs, has been waning. Most large pharmaceutical companies have been closing their very large natural product uh, screening, high for screening type activities, moving into the technologies which came to replace plants as sources of health. Because we've tested great plants for tens of thousands of years since basically humans evolved, right? And we've isolated a lot of good products from them, which became pharmaceuticals today. They were summarized in the slide in the beginning. But since then, in the last hundred years, competing technologies for discovering good pharmaceuticals has, have evolved. We can do certainly now in silica synthesis, uh, chemical synthesis, we can synthesize compound, we can very effectiveness, combinatorial chemistry, which can synthesize thousands of not millions of compounds came into play. Uh, targeted computational design, whether we can actually dock a molecule to a receptor, to a specific pharmacological target. We can use computers to actually uh, develop a structure which should do that and synthesize the molecule. And then, of course, biologics and gene therapy are becoming a big part. Certainly, COVID-19 epidemic showed that how important is the biologics, uh, the compounds, peptides, and vaccines, and protein-based type uh, pharmaceuticals. Um, next one, please. And yet, I think plants have one of the key still advantages uh, to some of those technologies because plants never solve their defense problems and never fight diseases with single compounds. Plants always make a mixtures of bioactive phytochemicals and their pharmacological or other activity is usually based on the synergies between different metabolites. That's why it's so difficult to isolate when you start doing activity guided fractionation so difficult to isolate single active compounds they work together and plants evolve this ability to make basically multi component pharmaceuticals because of the synergy between different compounds because if you do that you really make it very difficult for a pathogen to develop resistance mechanisms just like for example the human pathogenic bacteria rapidly develop resistance mechanism to a single antibiotic that's why we have such a big problem in our hospitals today. But plants, when you have six molecules working together, it's much harder to develop resistance. So still this multi-component botanicals, plant extracts, which contain several compounds work together, is something still unique to nature, which is very difficult to reproduce in a test tube. And so those multi-component botanicals, I think extracts, and our Chinese, I think all work with extracts, and we're delighted. I think this is where the power of plants lies in again contributing to our health, to our wellness, to our well being. Next one, please. So, where do, do those uh, complex botanicals, which hide in, in our jungles, in our forests, in our oceans, um, where the future is if it's not in developing new single ingredient pharmaceuticals? I think that future value is providing wellness to people, which is basically prevention uh, and beauty because cosmetic industry is still very keenly interested in plant natural products. Uh, and that's through no new generation of functional foods, dietary supplements, consumer cosmetic products. Those areas still are extremely interested in novel botanicals, particularly novel multi-component botanicals, the extracts where things work together because ideally and what you see on this graph what we want for people is to to live long productive lives and stay healthy throughout their life cycle and then then biological time comes hopefully now they say about 120 years i still have uh, 60 years of coming to indonesia i hope um well we 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 sort of senesce and and very rapidly so it is basically all prevention because drugs, pharmaceuticals do not address the problem of prevention. They're very few. They address the problem of treatment. So I think through functional food, through wellness, through cosmetic ingredients, uh, for all kinds of consumer products, this is where I think botanicals of the future will play a major role, basically changing our uh, life cycle from like one shown on the left, on the right to the one shown on so. So we have, so this is the few because pharmaceuticals don't address it. They all just cure it. Once you have it, you go to the doctor, getting it prescribed. We want to prevent and the, through food, through whatever we apply to our skins, uh, maybe for whatever we breathe, 
because there's a lot of essential oils, for example, which will do those functions and so forth. Next slide. The challenges, and I think this is very important, okay? It's not just that easy. One of the biggest problems with botanicals, particularly in very high biodiversity country like Indonesia, is truly knowing which plant you're making, producing an extract from. Because if you make a mistake, nobody can reproduce your results and nobody can uh, repeat your paper. And it's almost impossible to go back and find this plant. So all of us who, who are in this area should be very rigorous about quality control, particularly for the identity testing. We used to do it, we used to do it through depositing herbarium vouchers um, uh, which are associated with the sample we collected, particularly if it has flowers, we can use this herbarium voucher to identify the plant correctly. Well, this technology, which has been with us for hundreds of years, is being replaced. I mean, now, of course, we can substitute herbarium voucher by digital scans, and a lot of herbaria are now doing this. But more importantly, and more precisely, uh, about 20 years ago, DNA barcoding was used to identify plants where certain genes, which are well conserved, uh, can be sequenced, uh, and that can be related to uh, uh, plant taxonomy. It's very important. That technology is now being replaced by genome sequencing, total global genome sequencing, because it is so rapid now and so inexpensive. And you can do more than just identify plants. For example, if you sequence all DNA in your sample, you can identify contamination with some pathogenic organisms, with bacteria and so forth. Um, but what is also important is the thing, chemistry and metabolomics technology, where you can get the metabolomic profile of your extract, but particularly that allows standardization, not also identification of adulterants and contaminants, but also standardization, very, very important. So you have to know which plant you are harvesting, and this is the technologies you can use. Next one, please. But once you harvest the plant and you're making your extra for whatever, whatever purposes it is, you still face the challenges. And they're based on this plants being chemical chameleons. If you harvest old leaves, you'll get different metabolomics profile than you get when you harvest young leaves and so on. So that's why the quality control doesn't stop just at the correct taxonomic identification of your source plant, but you have to do biochemical profiling of your extracts all the time to make sure there's same compounds there. You should also have assays. And for example, you know, Gibex assays, which we, we, we brought to you, are, are good for that. We actually can functionally show using, for example, in vitro assays, so that extract you produced last year has the same activity that the extract you produce this year, because there's so many different compounds and they can be changing and they do change, we know that. And then manufacturing should be very strictly controlled because once you, it's a multi-component mixtures, once you change your manufacturing processes, you can actually change what you get at the end. So this is a challenge for, for this extract multi-component botanical industries, but those challenges can be overcome. And of course, we are working on that uh, internationally. Next one. Next slide, please. Uh, so here is my reading the leaves, and I hope that you will prove me wrong. This young generations of scientists will prove me wrong. I think the future of, future of natural product research, the future of new generations of wonderful healing products, which will come from plants, that future will be in, in, in mainly prevention and beauty, specifically in functional foods, Dietary supplements, which is this big category of botanicals you can buy in every supermarket in the US. Cosmetics and personal care, a big, big, big area. Uh, production of biologics, I think I have a slide. And uh, multi-component pharmaceuticals, which we call botanical drugs. Next slide, please. And we are seeing already the carbage. We're seeing the companies, the uh, research labs, which are doing this. For example, for the prevention for functional foods, it's become very clear that if one food is really good for you and good for your body and for whatever diseases you have or might have, a different person may have different genome, may have different metabolome in the gut, gut metabolome, and actually different foods will have different effects. It's, it's very genetic specific. There's a number of technologies and companies, for example, which now start from surveying 
uh, your, you know, how your parents lived, how long, which disease they have, what are your health complaints, and then specifically in a personalized manner prescribing individualized diets, different, com different foods to eat to you. Not all of us are the same. Um, but the most sophisticated part of this uh, personalized nutrition, uh, plant-based personalized nutrition technology comes from the uh, laboratories and companies which will actually sequence your DNA to see whether you have any genes which can cause problems in the future, whether it's cancer, whether it's arthritis, uh, and also look at your microbiome because microbiome is very important in processing, processing everything we eat. And based on this basically genomics information, we'll much more specifically prescribe personalized diets which will make you live longer. And this is, I think, a big area which will be growing. Next one. Uh, we've done pretty well in breeding the plants to change the composition of natural products. But most of it so far has been done for taste. So the, thing, the, the left part of this shows the uh, compounds which we reduced through breeding. And the, uh, well, it's on your, net, on your right the compounds which we increase through breeding. We've done it. So we change the genetic composition of secondary metabolites in plants through conventional breeding processes, uh, whether it's you know, peppers, potatoes, so many varieties of, of peppers in Indonesia, and all of them are taste differently. They have different amount of capsaicin, which is obviously the compound which gives us uh, spiciness and so forth. So next one. Uh, but this is now changing again, and we are now using science not only to breed for better taste, because really throughout the evolution, throughout the agricultural evolution, first what we were doing, we we're just breeding plants for calories. We wanted to, to feed people, we wanted to feed the people of the world, and it was always a big problem. So yield, 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 yield was really important. Despite all the dire predictions, we were spectacularly effective, I think, in this. And unless now there's a war in the country and unrest, we can now feed the growing population. I mean, this is an amazing success. So now we can afford, I think, to breed plants for health, knowing what are the valuable chemicals and how we can improve them using the methods I talked about. And even in the US, you now see all those products which now said good for cholesterol, lowest cholesterol, good for your heart, you start seeing those labels appearing in the food products and FDA, which is our regulatory agency, will require there's a rigorous scientific basis for putting those claims, which usually requires at least two clinical trials. And then you actually put that claim, claim note on your, uh, on your product, claim for health, and then in, in a way that will stimulate research and producing better and better functional foods. Next one, please. And then the last thing uh, I wanted to note, because this is important, and this is often uh, ignored. Plants are wonderful bioreactors. And they can very rapidly express transgenic proteins. And of course, since we are all moving into biologic vaccines and antibodies, they're easy, easily accessible technology now where you can take a field of tobacco or, or a greenhouse field of tobacco spray basically viral vector on it, and plants will start making vast amounts of protein, pharmaceutically valuable protein, now which can be then isolated. Uh, the speed of this is faster than whether you use CHO cells or yeast, which are sort of the classic expression systems for, for biologics and pharmacological proteins. And actually the first Ebola vac vaccine and the first vaccine which has been actually tested has been made in transgenic plants and, and use. So, Plants is by reactors because we can really very rapidly induce, uh, transform and, and produce proteins in plants. It's something which several quite successful companies are working on, particularly for antibodies and vaccine production. So here's another function of, of, of plants and as botanicals. Next one. Have a... All right, so um, at the end, all I want to show you is that our lab has been doing a lot of this research. And at this point, we have actually well studied and then developed several products which are actually on the market now, uh, using sort of these novel approaches to botanicals, to making healthier foods, uh, better cosmetics or dietary supplements. Uh, I believe I already talked about it, so I'm not gonna talk about it now, but we produce several varieties of lettuces. Lettuce is a very popular plant through actually 
uh, non-GMO approaches uh, for actually selecting in tissue culture, which is what Anna is doing, for example, by selecting lettuces which have 10 times more antioxidant polyphenols than normal lettuces, actually more than blueberries and other uh, high polyphenol plants which we use. So those are now uh, tested in at least five different companies and some of them are already available in the market. Very high levels of antioxidants, which just enhance the, the valuable polyphenols in those lettuces. And we have red and green. We've developed a couple of botanicals which are being sold now as a dietary supplement by, by Amway, which is a very large uh, supplement company. And then for cosmetic industry, I think uh, uh, Warren and I, we went to the, uh, one of the large malls and first we saw is uh, Estilota Contra with actually revitalizing creams which contain ingredients we developed, which we know what the actives are. Those are really anti-aging, anti-inflammatory, Moringa, isothiocyanates, specifically know what the actives are. We know what the mode of action is. And so they tested it and uh, in those tests it's shown to be very effective. So this is an important, important product now for us because it's sold throughout the world. So uh, I think my last slide, may I have that? The next one, please. So I really want to thank you all. Thank you all for coming here. As some of you may know, I, I love nature photography and throughout several trips, uh, which I took to Indonesia, not only I met all of you, wonderful people, wonderful young scientists, but the nature and the biodiversity of your country is absolutely amazing. And all I want to say and leave with the message, it's really worth conserving. It's because there's so many undiscovered products, compounds, which can truly benefit the lives of everybody on earth, uh, can come from your oceans, from your jungles, from the, the peat swamps in Borneo, which are amazing. And, and so thank you all very, very much uh, for coming here. Thank you. Thank you for Prof. Ilya for the speech. And Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we will get to the core of the event, the, the first international conference on natural product and chronic disease 2022, which will be moderated by Fadlan Muzaki, SIP Enfield LLM. For Mr. Fadlan, please take the floor. Well, thank you very much for Master of Ceremony, for our MC today, and for the participant, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning. On behalf of the Committee of International Conference this time, I'm standing or I'm sitting here as a moderator for this conference. And before we coming to this core event, I just want to get some notice from our keynote speakers. That's quite interesting. Not quite interesting, but it's very interesting. I just note some points. We just talk or we just discuss about chain duplication, horizontal, gen transfer. That's also contribute to biochemical evolution and then the secondary metabolism that way. And one of the most interesting things for me from the, the invited speaker, Professor Ilya Raskin, that the interest in natural product for drugs, which actually coming and um, or already happened in terms of trial and error since 10,000 years ago. And talking about natural products and the chronic disease 2022, I mean, this international conference, that's really, really important in terms of the recovery era after the COVID-19 pandemic. And when it comes to talking and discussing about health issues in the global citizens or in international societies. It's also, in front, it's, it's also important and it's also connected to the environmental and health issue. It's, it's mentioned before by the head of committee, it's also connected to the sustainable development goals, especially 
at the point number three. Without wasting time, I would like to invite the invited speakers who are coming offline and also online. I would like to invite Professor Dr. Ernawati Sinaga, MS APT from Universitas Nasional to coming to this stage. Please give applause. And secondly, I would like to invite Professor Dr. Samsudin M. Biomed APT from Universitas Pancasila to coming to this stage. Next one, I would like to invite Professor Endang Sukara from Indonesian Academy of Science, or commonly known as Academy Ilmu Pengetahuan Indonesia, and also represented from Universitas Nasional. And also, I would like to invite the invited speakers who coming or who attend this conference virtually. Professor Seidberg Satero from Avicenna Tajik State Medical University, Tajikistan. Yeah, maybe for the committee can show our invited speaker if he or she already coming to the screens. And the next, the next speakers, I would like to invite Professor Dr. Kamsa Suryati. Binti Mahmud from University Sultan Zainal Abidin, Malaysia. Well, okay, before we give the first opportunity to the invited speaker, I just want to say hey and greetings the participants who are coming online. Professor Saitbeck and Professor Kamsa, you can listen to me clearly? Yes. Oh, sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's wonderful. Without wasting the time, I would like to give the opportunity, the first opportunity to Professor Dr. Ernawati Sinaga, MS APT from Universitas Nasional to give her presentation. Professor Dr. Erna, the time is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. And thank you for the committee uh, who has invited me to give a small presentation today about the, can I have the slide, the, the PPT please? Yes, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. And I would like to welcome our friends from uh, US, Professor Dr. Ilya Raskin, Professor Sla uh, Slavik Bisenkov, and also Dr. Isabel Armas and Antonia. And thank you very much for all of you who have been uh, spend your time, who would like to spend your time with us today here to attend and to join us uh, in this conference. I would like to talk a little bit about the potential of Indonesian underutilized fruits as functional beverage. Next slide, please. Yeah, actually, even though it is uh, already known everywhere, most of us maybe uh, already know what is the functional beverage, but I think not all of us uh, have familiar with this uh, term. Next slide, please. Functional beverage is part of a subsystem of the functional food. Functional food is whole foods along with fortified, enriched, or enhanced foods that have a potentially beneficial effect on health when consumed as part of a right diet on regular basis. As I'm sorry, I would like to open my, my uh, laptop first because it's too far away, so I cannot read it. Excuse me. 
Yes. Function, functional food is whole foods along with fortified and rich or enhanced foods that have a potentially beneficial effect on health. When consumed as part of a right diet on a regular basis at effective level based on significant standard of evidence. This is the definition of functional food from the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. The more, the simpler definition may be uh, at the bottom of this, this slide. Functional food are foods that provide a specific health benefit in addition to the benefit of general macro and micronutrients. So functional foods should have specific health benefits. And according to this, uh, next slide please. In line with this definition, functional beverage is a non-alcoholic drinks that contains ingredients including herbs, vitamins, minerals, amino acid, dietary fibers, or added raw fruit or vegetable ingredients, which is claimed to provide specific health benefit beyond those of general nutrition, for example, in enhancing the immune systems, protecting cardiovascular systems, improving metabolic system, improving joint mobility, etc. Next slide, please. So uh, after we know what is the functional beverage is, so we should uh, think about the fruits. Fruits are mo the most suitable product, natural product that su suitable for functional beverage. Why is the fruit are suitable for functional beverage? Mainly is because fruits always have high dietary fiber. Fruits also have, almost all fruits have high polyphenols and flavonoids. And we know almost flu, fruits have good taste, excellent flavor, and also attractive color. Next slide, please. Indonesia has a huge number of fruits tree in, in our country. According to uh, some papers, Indonesia has around 255 to 300 species fruit trees in Indonesia. And unfortunately, only 50 to 60 species are cultivated. So it means that more than 200 species are not cultivated. They are grow wild. Why are they uh, grow wild? Why, why, why people not cultivate this species? Because they don't know what is the benefit of grow this species. Next slide, please. This species of fruits that we call the underutilized fruits. So underutilized fruits are the fruits which are neither grown commercially on large scale, nor traded widely. The underutilized fruits are those which have minor market value, not widely grown in the field and rarely found in the market. That is the underutilized fruits. Next slide, please. And Indonesia has a huge number of underutilized fruits. Some of these underutilized fruits, I put here the picture of the fruits, just to let you know that we have in Indonesia a huge number of underutilized fruits, that we have to do something to make the underutilized fruits give us more, give us more benefit. Next, please. This is the filantase. We know these fruits, it is rambai or bakaurea motlayana. On the right side is menteng, probably uh, some of us know menteng. Next, please. And this is uh, a rare one. We people, the local people 
call it kekali. I think Ilya has uh, eat this fruit while we are going to Tuhanan. Yeah, this uh, kekali. And at left uh, right side is a more a, a more rare fruit that they call kelewetan. Next, please. This is uh, we know probably um, most of us here know this. This on the left side is cerme and on the right side is buah malaka. Uh, we know at Cianjur, many people saw these fruits as manisan or candy. People, local people in uh, West Java made this made candy or sweet meat from these uh, uh, fruits. Next, please. This is the fruits that many of this uh, many of Anacardiaceae member is endemic to Indonesia. The first one is Mangifera kasturi. We call it in Kalimantan kasturi. And the white one is Mangifera kemangi, or we usually call it kemang. From the names, we know that these fruits are endemic to Indonesia because the botanical names or the species name pick the Indonesian uh, Indonesian name. Kemang, so they call it Mangifera kemanga, and kasturi, Mangifera kasturi. Next, please. And this is uh, the more well-known fruits. Uh, Kweni at the left side and Bacang at the right side. Next, please. Now, this is a very attractive uh, fruits belong to Anacardiaceae family and uh, is being investigated by our team here in UNAS. Alvira, Rina, Alvira and Rina investigated these fruits for their cardiovascular effect and also for their uh, heart, uh, sorry, uh, hepatoprotective effect. Next, please. This is, uh, we can still find these fruits at Kalimantan, but they never grown it to in, intend to, to, to sell in the market. They just grow in the house yard for, to consume by the family. Next, please. This is um, what we call asam glugur. And at the right side is asam kandis. Next, please. Yes, these fruits belong to Morase family. I think only a few of us have seen this fruit, but we still we still can find these fruits at Kalimantan, but not in Java, not in Jakarta. The it's it belongs to the fa the Morase family, the same family as Cempedak and Nangka, the jackfruit, but they are different. They are sweeter and they are uh, they they give a more aromatic uh, a more aromatic fragrance they are very very delicious but it it's hard to find now even in the market in kalimantan but still the the tree is in is there in kalimantan next please this is a special fruits for me because it's hard to find and the the taste is so delicious. They call it fruits from heaven because it grows, it's a liana. It grows up, up in a high tree, in a big tree. So it's hard to get. But wherever we take the, we, ha we have the fruits, it's very delicious. We call it a gitaan or limat. Next, please. This is a, a unique fruit, have a pink color, a shocking pink color. The taste is almost like um, avocado. 
and it belongs to avocado family Lauraceae. Next, please. This is Bidara. This is what Pak Ndang will investigate it for for the next two years. Bidara, Zisipus Mauritiana, belong to Ramnase family. And also our student here, Hanifa and Shafira, and also Alia, investigating these fruits for anti hypercholesteremic activity and uh, hepatoprotective activity. Next, please. Okay. So there are a huge number of roots in our country and only few of them are investigated. We still have no, not many or not much information about those fruits. So in UNAS, we try to, to investigate it, some fruits, some rare fruits, some underutilized fruits, to check whether they are suitable to develop to be a function to be functional drink or functional beverage. As we know, the more the easier parameter to look at the fruits to check whether they are have health benefit is the antioxidant activity and the total phenols and total flavonoids. We check some fruits like Rhodomyrtus tomentosa, Boya macrophylla, Sisyphus mauritiana, Sisychium polycephalum, Lacurtia inermis, and Philanthus acidus for the antioxidant activity, total phenols, and total flavonoids. And you can see the, the result of the investigation. I would, I would not like to to explain any more about this uh, this uh, result because you have seen that the, we do this investigation on the fruit juice so we not extract the fruits with uh, ethanol for example or methanol or other solvent but we just press the fruits and take the juice and do the the assay I would like to, next please, I would like to, uh, to explain to, or to give information a little bit about what we have done in our project. The first fruit that we try to investigate it, the, the next two years is Rhodomyrtus tomentosa, or we call it Karamunting or Kemunting in Indonesia. This is the white fruit plant thrives in tropical region of Africa, America, and Asia, including Indonesia. The fruit juice consists of dietary fibers, polyphenols, and has high anthocyanins. Next, please. This is the fruits. It's very, it has very attractive color and also very delicious, the juice. At the right side is the juice after we press the fruits. Uh, the fresh fruits is pressed and we get the, the juice and uh, keep it in the refrigerator. Oh, sorry, in the freezer. Next slide, please. We check for the hepatoprotective activity and the activity to prevent hypercholesterolemia and atherosclerosis in red fat with high fat and high cholesterol diet. Next, please. This is the flow of the research. We use 30 males pragodoli reds and fed them with uh, high fat, high cholesterol diet for 75 days. And along with that, we treat the, the reds with the with the juice and we use we use infastatin as the uh, positive control next please 
And the, the result is, uh, for me, is very good. It's a very uh, successful research. The research is uh, conducted by six of my students and do it very good, very well. They did it very well. We can see here, this is for the uh, hepatoprotect hepatoprotective activity. We check the AHT level and ALT level in the serum. And we can see here, um, the first bar is the, the AST and ALT level of the he healthy rats. And the next one, the high bar is the AST and ALT level for the uh, rats that given high fat, high cholesterol diet. So we consider the rats is a hypercholesteremic rats. And the third bar is the, yeah, you can see at the bottom of the, of the graph that the third bar is the reds, the hypercholesteremic reds given atorvastatin, or simvastatin, sorry. And the three, the four, five, and six bar is the level of the ST and ALT of the reds who is who was given the the juice in different at different doses we can see here that the juice significantly reduce the level of ast and alt as we know ast and alt is the parameter usually usually used to to show the hepat the hep the function the function of the liver so if the ast and ALT level rise or high it means the hepar or the liver is uh, is the match so you can it, we can see here that the juice can prevent the damage of the liver of the reds fat with high fat high cholesterol diet so it's positively, significantly uh, positive has the hepatoprotective activity. Next, please. This is the histopathologic uh, picture of the rats. It also show that the rats fed with the high fat, high cholesterol diet has a bad uh, histopathologic uh, picture while the reds given the juice has uh, almost the same histopathologic picture as the healthy reds. Next, please. And we also investigate the activity of the juice to prevent the hypercholesteremia and also the atherosclerosis formation in the same rats. Next, please. And we can see here the total glycerides and total cholesterol levels of the rats that were fed or treated with the juice is significantly lower than the red untreated, unt untreated with the juice. And all and the blue one at the first bar is the healthy reds. So we can see here that even though the juice cannot prevent the increase of the triglyceride and cholesterol level to be as the same as the healthy, healthy reds, but it is significantly lowered, significantly reduced, or significantly low, lower than the reds uh, and the reds fed with high cholesterol and high fat diet. Next, please. 
This is the same uh, investigation. This is this bar, this graph. So the LDL cholesterol and HDL cholesterol level. And it uh, shows the, the same thing as the total cholesterol and total triglyceride. Next, please. And this is, uh, this is the picture that I like so much because it, clear, it significantly and clearly show that the supplementation of the fruit juice significantly pre uh, prevent the atherosclerosis formation. We can see here, the first picture saw the healthy rats uh, aortic wall, uh, the, the aortic wall of the healthy rats. And the second picture at the upper side is the aortic wall of the rats that were fed with high fat, high cholesterol diet. And at the bottom is the red, at uh, the third, at the bottom bar, at the bottom side, is the red that give, that were fed with, with high fat, high cholesterol diet, and at the same time treated with uh, Rhodomyrtus tomentosa juice. So it's clearly show us that the juice is very effective, significantly effective to prevent the atherosclerosis formation in the reds aortic, uh, with, uh, which will, which uh, given high fat, high cholesterol diet. Next, please. This is also, okay, okay. Uh, this is uh, the same observation on the coronary arterial wall of the same reds. We can see the same and we, we can conclude. Next, please. Next, please. We can conclude that the supplementation of Rhodomyrtus tomentosa fruit juice is significantly effective to prevent the uh, the the rate the right the rays of hypercholesteremia to prevent the hypercholesteremic and atherosclerosis formation in the red fat with high fat high cholesterol high cholesterol diet. This is the second fruit that is being investigated. It's not uh, done yet, but some data can be I can I can give you here. Boya macrophylla, or we call it Ramania. It's, it is a flowering plant native to Southeast Asia. It is uh, actually a uh, tribe in Indonesia, especially in Indonesia, in, at the east side of Indonesia, east of Indonesia. But it, we can also find these fruits in uh, Java, especially in West Java. These fruits is belong to Anacardiaceae, and the fruits are edible. But in Jakarta and also in West Java, we usually the young fruits for sambals, for chili sauce. We are not often I uh, consume the ripe fruits, but in Ternate or in Maluku, they they use they often consume this uh, this uh, ripe fruits because it's sweet, sour, sour sweet, and uh, actually for me it's delicious. But some people said it's too sour, but it's good. The taste is good. Next, please. We also investigate the effect of supplementation of Buya macrophylla fruit juice on lipid serum. And this is the result. This uh, graph show us that the more 
we gave the juice to the rats, it doesn't mean that it has a higher effect. We can see here that the best effect is given by the medium dose. The higher the dose, the lower dose give a, a small effect, the medium dose give a higher effect, but when we add the dose to make it higher, it doesn't, doesn't lower, the, it doesn't uh, do the, the good thing, but it is, it's, it's, so it's like, uh, I don't know whether we can say that it's not good to, to consume or to, to, to have the, the fruit juice too much. But uh, as yeah, the medium, the medium is always the best. Next, please. And this is also uh, give the same uh, conclusion about Mokuya macrophila. And the next, uh, the students still investigating these fruits, and I hope they will have good results so we can uh, publish it in a good journals. Next, please. In conclusion, I can say that Indonesia has a large number of underutilized fruits that should be investigated to reveal their potential as functional beverage. Next, please. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Well, thank you very much for Professor Dr. Ernawati Sinaga. That's so insightful presentation. And uh, of course, the presentation is coming from the recent research conducted by uh, the professor. Ladies and gentlemen, we just we have just listened the presentation about the potential of Indonesian underutilized fruits as functional beverage. One thing that strikes me about the presentation is about the fruits that we face in daily activity that already mentioned, like menteng, cermai, malaka, kasturi, so on and so forth, that actually has benefit for us, uh, especially for our health. And I believe for you, I mean, some of you already have the question for this presentation, but just keep you not keep your question for the discussion session because now we turn to the second speakers. We turn to the second presentation, which will be delivered by Professor Dr. Samsudin M. Biomed APT from Universitas Pancasila. Without wasting time, the time is yours. Thank you, uh, moderator. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, everybody. Uh, the Honorable Professor Ilya Raskin and Slavik from CBCD USA, and the Honorable uh, Professor Dr. Enawati Sinaga from Universitas Pancasila, and ladies and gentlemen, and I would like to presentation our research entitled Anti-Diabetic Potential of Polyherbal Formulation by Clinical Development Safety and Efficacy Studies. Next, please. And diabetes is a chronic disorder in metabolism of carbohydrates, protein, and fat due to absolute or relative deficiency of insulin secretion with without varying degree of insulin resistance. According to the World Health Organization, the number of persons with type 2 diabetes mellitus in Indonesia would more than triple by 2030, raising 21.3 million people in the country. It is estimated that around 1.6 million fatalities were directly attributed to DM in the same year, with another 2.2 million deaths being attributed to elevated blood glucose. Next, please. 
There are two types of diabetes mellitus. Type 1 juvenile uh, diabetes mellitus, insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus, which is hereditary and is treated by insulin. And type 2 adult type non-insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus, which appear in elderly people and is treated by controlling the diet and oral hypoglycemic drug. Regardless of the type of diabetes, patients are required to control their blood, blood glucose with medication and or by adhering to an exercise program and a dietary plan. Next, please. Next, please. Yes, next please. This is major complication of diabetes, uh, microvascular and uh, macrovascular, and eye, kidney, neuropathy, brain, heart, and extremities. Next please. And uh, this is uh, anti-diabetic oral and side effect. Uh, for example, metformin uh, GI tract, um, sorry. And glibenclamic prolonged hypoglycemic and glipicid weight gain hypoglycemic and pioglitasan udem and DPP4 inhibitor GI effect. Next, please. And the limitation of currently available oral antidiabetic agent, either in terms of efficacy and septic couple with the emergency of the disease into a global epidemic, have encouraged a concerted effort, effort to discover drugs that can manage to type diabetes more efficiently. Also, with increasing incidence of diabetes mellitus in rural population throughout the world and due the to adverse effects of synthetic medicine. There is a clear need for development of indigenous and expensive botanical source for anti-diabetic root of purified drugs. Now the treatments of diabetes, including diabetes using medicinal plant, are recommended because this, these plants contain various vital constituents, such as flavonoids, terpenoids, saponins, carotenoids, alkaloids, and glycoside, which may process anti-diabetic activities. Next, please. hop hop combination, also known as polyherbal therapy, have been used in Chinese medicine practice for thousands of years. Yet scientific evidence of uh, their therapeutic benefit is lacking. Drug combination often produce a promising effect in treatment of disease over a single drug. The concept of drug combination has been well established in Western medicine and remarkable success has been achieved over the decades. Naturally occurring herbs and herbal ingredients. Why is polyherbal combination? Naturally occurring herbs and herbal ingredients organized into certain formula have been shown to have potential interaction effect. This includes mutual enhancement, mutual assistance, mutual restraints, and mutual antagonism. Next, please. This is traditional Indonesian medicine. Traditional Indonesian medicine is known as jamu. Besides jamu, there are two groups of Indonesian natural medicine namely standardized herbal medicine and phytopharmaca. These three classifications are given for herbal medicine produced in Indonesia. To distinguish between jamu, ohati, and phytopharmaca, the public can recognize through the following logo uh, product with this logo when circulated in Indonesia, must obtain a distribution permit number, namely uh, POMTR, BOMHT and Phytopharmaca issues by BPOM. Next, please. Traditional Indonesian medicine and herbal medicine pro uh, products contain a combination of botanical, 
each of these contains a number of chemical compounds that might give the anticipated activity in combination. Polyherbal formulation have plant-based pharmacological agent which might exert synergistic potential tip agonistic antagonistic action by virtue of, of its associated diverse active principle themselves. Next, please. Uh, standardized herbal medicine are medicinal preparation of natural ingredients that have been scientifically verified to be safe and effective by preclinical testing and standardized raw material. These herbal medicine are generally supported by scientific evidence in the form of preclinical research. Next, please. Preclinical Development Safety and Efficacy Study. This is uh, our product, our research product uh, on ODIAP. Consists uh, composition, Smasatus Sonsipolis, uh, Camellia sinensis, Cisigium polyantum, and Stepia. Smalatus sonsipolium, its scientific name is Yakon, and it's Andrian plant that belong to the composite family of plants. And the stepia plant is one of the natural low calorie sweetener derived from plant. A tea, which uh, is produced from the plant Camellia sinensis, is enjoyed worldwide in various forms such as green, black, and oolong tea. And Cigigium polyantum is a plant that relates to Myrta seed family that usually used in Indonesia. Many studies have confirmed that its extract of anti-hyperglycemic potential that could be applied a new therapy for DM. Next, please. This is our uh, frame reset. Uh, and uh, there are there are, there are, there are for uh, plan in research uh, stelpia rebaudidiana and so, smalantus sonsipolium and uh, camellia sinensis and cisigium polyantum and part of uh, leaf and uh, powder and extracts with uh, ethanol seventy uh, uh, percent for twenty for. Uh, hours and three times, and filtered, uh, evaporated by crude extract. And crude extract and fractionation, uh, fractionation and fraction uh, to activity assay in in vitro combination, alpha glucose, alpha glucosidase uh, inhibition, and alpha amyl uh, alpha amylase inhibition, and IC50. Uh, uh, frax, uh, active fraction in Anti-diabetic activity in red uh, induced by aloxan or streptocytosin uh, and preclinical studies. Preclinical studies, uh, uh, we investigate acute toxicity, supranic activity, teratogenic activity for uh, the best combination and uh, plan for isolation uh, for uh, marker marker for. Uh, for standardization by LCM, SMS, CR, MNR, and then active compound uh, or marker is uh, analysis docking for uh, how interaction and uh, active uh, active uh, active compound and uh, enzyme. Next, please. This is uh, alpha glucose inhibitory effect of polyherbar formulation and uh, you can see F4 and uh, potent uh, depend and table 3 anti-diabetic activity polyherbar formulation in aloxan induced type 2 diabetic mice for uh, F4. The polyherbar has an inhibitory effect with IC50 value of 26.23 microgram ml compared to a carbose was 70.02 microgram ml. The diabetic animals were observed to show an abscessious decline in glucose level then compared with control after treatment. Next, please. 
This is the atanolic effect comparison of the formulation polyherbal on body weights of treated and controlled mice during subacute toxicity study. To complement the the acute toxicity result, the oral subacute toxicity was conducted on the mice by administering antidiabetic polyherbal formulation once daily for 28 days. It was observed that main body weight of male and female mice from day 0 to 28 fluctuated. However, there was no significant change in the body weight for each group. This indicated that there were no toxicity symptoms. Next, please. Uh, this is effect of polyherbal and hematological parameter of male and female mice in subacute toxicity or subchronic toxicity. The hematological examination, which include the parameter of BBC, white blood cell, red blood cell, hemoglobin, hematocrit, mean corpuscular volume, mean corpuscular hemoglobin, mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration, and platelet or thrombocyte level were measured after the test animal were treated for 28 days. Overall, the results show that there were no significant difference in male and female mice with most of the parameter amongst that group. Next, please. This is effect pro, uh, polyherbal on biochemical parameter of male and female mice in sub uh, chronic or sub acute toxicity. There were no significant difference between the, nor the normal and the dose group in the liver function parameter, namely aspartate aminotransferase, alanine aminotransferase, and albumin. Higher uh, ISR and ILT level then control indicated interference of the hepatocyte function. So both IST and ILT will be released into bloodstream. Lower albumin level is associated with interference of hepatocyte synthesis function, especially in chronic hepatocyte lesion. There were no significant difference between in the normal and the dose group in the measuring result of uh, blood urea nitrogen and creatinine. Next, please. This is a uh, histological of kidney section of control mile uh, and histology of uh, figure two, histological of kidney section of control female mice. Pick, uh, pick A, control group, pick B, uh, treatment. Next, please. The presence finding suggests that polyherbar formulation from Yakon, Smalantus sonsipolius, T, Camilla sinensis, Salam, Sisygium polyantum, and Stepia is non-toxic since no market change in hematological, biochemical, and histopathological parameter were observed. Therefore, at normal therapeutic dose, formula polyherbal is considered to be safe for long-term treatment of diabetic condition. This study finally emphasizing that the antibiotic polyhybrid formulation from Yakon, T, Salam, and Stevia were very safe up to uh, 5,000 milligram per kilogram body weight dose in animal model. Next, please. This is mechanism of action. The, ono, the onodiap composis, composition consisting of uh, Smalantus sonsipolius, uh, Sisygium polyantum, Camilla sinensis, and Stepia rebaudiana. You can see uh, Smalantus sonsipolius uh, is uh, active compound, the caffeogenic acid, chlorogenic acid, and mechani mechanism of action and antioxidant, decrease alpha glucosidase, decrease alpha amylase, and decrease blood glucose. And Sisygium polyantum, active compound quercetin, mechanism of action for antidiabetes, antioxidant, antioxidation, uh, decrease blood glucose, decrease uh, glucose absorption. And Camellia sinensis, active compound tannin, uh, mechanism of function, uh, increase pancreatic beta cell function, antioxidation, 
and decrease glucose absorption. And stevia rebodiana, rebodiana aktif tempon stevioglycoside and mechanism of action decrease alpha glucosidase, decrease alpha amylase, insulinotropic gluconeostatic and down regulation uh, gain expression. Next. Uh, this is uh, standardized and our product marker uh, with marker based standardization a polyherbal formulation on a diet capsule by TLC densitometer metro method. Next slide. Uh, this is uh, with biomarker standardization compound stepiocyte from stepia rebaudiana, catechin from camellia sinensis, chlorogenic acid from smalanthus sonsipolium, and quercitrin from uh, Syzygium polyantum. Next, please. This is estimation of stepiocyte catechin chlorogenic acid and quercitrin in onodia capsule. Uh, is catechin and average percent of marker compound for 0.77 and quercitrin uh, 30.02%, stepiocyte and 4.4% and chlorogenic acid uh, 28.33% uh, Next please Hub H PPLC densitometric method uh, simple, precise, uh, specific, and economical for the quantification of the stevioside, catechin, chlorogenic acid, and quercetrin, bioactive markers found in onodiap. The methods were validated to trace the marker in complex mixture of herbal drug use in onodiap. The plot but uh, methods can also be used in routine quality control of herbal raw material as well as formulation containing the same markers. Next, please. This is our product and registered uh, for JAMU. And uh, our planning, uh, this our product up to herbal, obat herbal terstandar or H. Uh, OHT. Next, please. This acknowledgement, I would to thank to Brin uh, for grant uh, supporting in grants in Sinas uh, for uh, two, two, two years, 2019 and 2020. And PT Nucleus Pharma, PT Nuswantara. Uh, Nirmala Nusantara uh, produced by uh, Onodiap capsule for anti-diabetic and our PhD student uh, uh, Dr. Johelmi Aziz and Lilik Sulasri and Pam. Next please. This is output our research and uh, publication uh, patent and uh, product registered. Uh, thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much for Professor Dr. Samsudin uh, for the presentation. I just want to notice and to mark some of the presentation about the drugs combination, polyherbal, and the type of traditional Indonesian medicine, which consists of three types, actually. It's not only jamu, as we know before. And also, we, also uh, we, we, we heard or we listened about the process of preclinical development polyherbal formulation and also the result. I also believe this interesting presentation has been raising some of questions by, by some of the attendants here. But just like before, before the presentation, just keep your note, keep your question because we will have the discussion session after this. And we now move to the third presentation, which will be delivered virtually by Professor Said Sattar from Avicenna Tajik State Medical University, Tajikistan. 
before we start, I think I just want to make sure that Professor Seidberg already online and listen to us here who coming offline. Professor. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, dear colleagues. I am glad to welcome you to this conference dedicated uh, to topical issues of modern biology and medicine. Uh, Tajikistan, like other Asian countries, characterized by a wide variety of uh, medicinal, medicinal plants. Many of them are endemic and some of them are unexplored. Uh, the research work of uh, our young specialists is uh, mainly devoted to the study of the pharmacognostic properties endemic species growing in our country. Uh, some species of ferula, allium, mipita, uh, geranium belong to little studied endemics. The recent work of uh, Dr. Fazila Mirzoeva is devoted to characteristic of some allium species growing in Tajikistan. And uh, she will now talk about the result uh, of her research. Uh, Fazila, please, you can start. Oh, well, okay, Professor Seidberg, you listen to us, right? It is clear? You listen it clearly? Uh, will help me, my assistant, Professor Fadila. Okay, we give, we give the opportunity she, she will to do a presentation. presentation. Uh, Fadila, you can start. Yes, yes, I can start. Hello, everyone. Thank you for uh, permission to be one of them participants and uh, of uh, participants of the, uh, this uh, scientific conference. And uh, as we know, I was uh, one of them trainees uh, of this big project between uh, <clears throat> Rutgers University, uh, your university, and our Tajik Medical University that related, uh, our research was related to study about, study about um, species and mainly about species, endemic species that grow in a specific area and in Tajikistan. Uh, with your permission, I will, will talk about my research that related to study about correlation between content of polyphenols and fungicidal activity endemic onions, uh, Tajikistan. Next slide, please. Next, sorry. Okay, about plants and medical herbs have long been of great interesting in mankind. They have a mild therapeutic effect uh, on the human body as well as fever and side effect. Over the past 20 years, there has been an increase in interest in the study of natural materials as source of new antibacterials again. Because as we know, from years to years, microorganisms produce antibacterial resistance. That's why our aim was to study about uh, antibacterial activities and antifungal activities also. Various extracts from traditional medicinal plants and some natural products have been approved as new antibacterial drugs. Thank you, next. And about genus of allium, which includes more than 90, 900 species and more representatives grows in our Republic that start from uh, allium sativum, allium sepa, allium nutans, and many, many kinds. And they have beneficial effect to human body. And onion species are very diverse in their ecological command. Onions, one of the main source of dietary polyphenols. Polyphenols, as we know, are groups of water-soluble substances that have widespread in the plant world. More than 500 
polyphenols have been identified in the human body that have number of beneficial effects subjects to a variety of sources of their intake. The most famous sources include in wine, red wine, tea, dark chocolate, and onions also. Please, next. And based on these uh, properties, uh, on these um, subjects, we uh, our aim was studying nature of correlation between the content of polyphenols and fungicidal activity and study of biological activity substances of endemic species growing in the territory of Tajikistan. Next slide. Next, please, slide. Two kinds of the endemic onions we study in my research, it was one of them, Allium palmiricum vendelbo and Allium shugnanicum evet. Next slide. slide. Uh, in our project, we work based on the uh, programs or working programs by GBIX, GBIX, by the staff of Ruskin Laboratory. And from each sample, we study three parts of the all onions. It was seeds or flowers, steam, and bulbs. Please, next slide. <clears throat> uh, based on the, uh, this program, two grams of each sample was crushed and mixed with five milliliter of 50% uh, of alcohol or ethanol. And uh, we uh, then uh, 90 milliliter disc was impregnated with this extract from various parts or organs of onions. And we prepared slide, uh, disc, sorry, that this disc was dried at room temperature at the same uh, hours. Please, next slide. Uh, studied of antifungal activity of onions, we studied by this diffusion, this diffusion method on solid agar, uh, and uh, was used for a microorganism that we study antifungal activities of uh, these onions was candida albicans, and main nutrition was that uh, used for ant uh, antifungal activity. It was saburo agar. Please next slide. On the surface of nutrition media, as I said previously, it was saburo agar. Fungal culture previously diluted according to turbidity standard and was inoculated. The finished disc was placed on the agar surface and incubated at 37 degrees uh, for 24 hours. Please, next slide. And the result, result of antifungal activity, we account by measuring the zone of inhibition of the growth microorganism around each disk, as we see it in this slide. Please, next. Next slide, please. Uh, quantitative determin determination of content of polyphenols was studied using the fallen chocolateo method which is based on the interaction of the foreign chocolate region with any polyphenols present. The presence of polyphenols was measuring by the content of milligram of gallic acid per milliliter of plant extract. The nature of the correlation between fungicidal activity and the content polyphenols was determined according to Pearson. Please, next slide. And about result of my uh, research, I want to say that uh, antifungal activity we measured by milligram millimeter around the disc, and we found some uh, <clears throat> statistical significance direct correlation between antifungal activity properties of poly polyphenol content in the stem of Allium shugnanicum. The higher the content of polyphenol, the stronger the antifungal properties, and vice versa, the lower the content of polyphenol, the lower the antifungal properties. There are also inverse weak correlation between antifungal properties and antioxidant activity in the seeds and stems of Allium shugnanicum. However, they are not statistically significant. 
Thank you so much for your permission to be participants and thank you so much the best and best of luck thank you for your attention thank you dear colleagues thank you Fabiza uh, we finish our presentation Well, um, thank you very much for Professor Setberg and his assistant. I, I'm so sorry, I just like, coming back from the beside because I need to go to the toilet. And as far as I listened from the presentation from Professor Setberg and his assistant, we have just discussed about the correlation between Ken and Ponimed Pus for Fungi Biocidal activity endemic onions in Tajikistan. And I just mark a little bit, little things about the genus Elium, which is include more than 900 species, more, so more, and so forth. I think, um, I think, and I believe maybe some of you here already have a question for this presentation as well. But we still have two more invited speakers. And without wasting time, we would like to invite Professor Endang Sukara from Indonesian Academic of Science, or commonly known as Academy Ilmu Pengetahuan Indonesia. For Professor Endang Sukara, the time is yours. Okay, thank you very much. I would like to continue uh, our <laughs> presentation. Today, I just would like to uh, discuss about the fermentation of Gigipus auretania or Bidara and its potential as raw material for functional drink formulation. Next slide, please. Uh, this actually starting when we study at the Saleh Bay, Moyo Island, and Tambora Biosphere Reserve, or Samota Biosphere Reserve, which conducted about two years. It's actually uh, end of the project is uh, uh, last, last year, I think. Samota Biosphere is very unique because it's actually located at the southern part of what I say region. Obviously, this will be a unique uh, area. You know? lot of endemicities also there. During the last two years, we actually study also <coughs> on the biodiversity of uh, Samota Biosphere Reserve. Next slide. Oh, and conducted primarily studies on biodiversity at uh, Boyo Island. Maybe the committee could help us to just mute the other participant who coming virtually. Thank you. Okay. And uh, in this Saleh Bay, And Batuate, actually in Medang Island and also Oyo Island, we also we we found a bidara, the jijipus there, and grow quite 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 well in this area. Next next slide, please. And we actually search also. 
the publication on uh, Bidara on the Jizipus. Lot of publication there, but next slide, please. Next slide. And we saw that the, the research on Bidara is dominated by the research on leaf of the Bidara. A very small uh, research being done on the fruit and less on, on the seed, of course. Next slide, please. The lot of information on, on Bidara, including the chemical content, which should be a great potential for a raw material for uh, medicinal uh, purposes. But as I mentioned, that the research on Bidara fruit is actually not really much. It's underutilized, actually. Next slide, please. I just would like to see here. Yeah. <laughs> it's a As I highlighted here, the fruit is edible and has medicinal properties. Currently, Bidara fruits underutilized and has almost no economic value. We are just glad from Prof. Erna's student information, which might, might be highlighted uh, more detail this afternoon. The the Bidara fruit containing a lot of chemical content, which is beneficial for medicinal. And I just learned also from her studies that Bidara fruit juice also contain uh, before, yeah. Ganoderic acid, which is actually not common because ganoderic acid is coming from Ganoderma, the fungus. But Bidara uh, fruit, uh, according to the studies, is actually uh, have ganoderic acid also. Ganoderic acid is very important because a lot of medicinal uh, properties there, including fighting a cancer, for example, liver and kidneys protectant, will help affect fatigue fighting and energy building properties, pain reducing effect, for example, for example, and also antioxidant. Next slide, please. So my my idea is actually trying to ferments the Bidara fruit. We have a lot of publication actually when we fermenting the fruit, a lot of benefits coming in. So I do believe that Bidara fruit is actually constituent major constituent of Bidara fruit, I mean, is could be sugar, organic acid, and also mineral. They can be metabolized to another compound by many bacteria or many microorganisms, including lactic acid bacteria. During the fermentation process, for the quality of enrichment of the final fermented beverages. We do believe that a lot of medicinal properties will come up 
from this fermentation process. And we could also have a more aroma there. And so we are thinking using certain microorganisms. I also would like to mention here that collection of lactic acid bacteria in my old laboratorium in Brin in Sibino is uh, quite uh, uh, a huge collection we have. So maybe we can actually use this microorganism to ferment the bidara fruit to produce uh, better uh, functional, medicinal fun functional uh, drink. And also we could actually uh, improve the aroma, improve the taste. So we are actually hoping that using this uh, mechanism method of fermenting herbal, fermenting uh, bitter fruit could actually uh, provide a lot of opportunities to develop uh, functional uh, beverages. So this is actually uh, my ideas. And we have, at the moment, with Professor Erna, we have two students, master student, who is going to go to this, uh, to this uh, uh, research. Hopefully, we can have uh, something. Next slide, please. We just continue. Next slide, please. So we we are we are trying to uh, see different factors affecting the growth of microorganisms, including especially the lactic acid bacteria, to produce uh, raw material uh, for uh, fermented. Uh, bidara of fruits and producing functional beverages. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, that's actually my, my uh, proposal. Uh, hopefully, we'll be starting uh, this year and uh, go to uh, next year probably. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for the presentation, Professor Endang Sukara. It's talking about fermentation of Zipus Maurintiana fruits, and it's also, also talking about Pidara fruits. I also believe you, you might have some question regarding this presentation, but just keep your notes, keep your question, because after this speaker, this last speaker, we will have discussion session. Uh, without wasting time, we would like to invite the last invited speakers, Professor Dr. Kamsa Suryati Binti Mok from University Sultan Zainal Abidin, Malaysia, which will present the presentation virtually. Oh, okay, here you are. The time is yours. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairperson. Uh, I would like to thank the, organize, the organizing committee for inviting me here. Uh, can I have the slide or I should share my own slide? Okay, while waiting for my slide, are you uh, the organizer going to share my slide, right? <clears throat> okay, um, while waiting for my slide, um, 
I am uh, from University of Sultan Zainal Abidin here in Malaysia. Um, so I work uh, uh, for natural product for uh, quite a number of uh, time. Um, I think around more than uh, 15 years working on natural products, especially on the herbal medicine. All right. Okay, thank you. So uh, for the uh, for today, I would like to talk some of the work that we have done in my labs, um, uh, currently working and also work in the past. Uh, so we are uh, working on various aspects of the potential of the natural products. And today I would like to share with you all uh, our work on uh, the anti-fibroid. Uh, potentials for the uh, few species of medicinal plants and also other type of natural products. So next slide, please. Right, as we know, natural product is uh, uh, is the main source of the chemical compounds or being used as a botanical drugs, as we heard uh, this morning from the previous speakers. Uh, it may be used as a functional food, it may be used as the source of the, uh, the skeleton for the new drugs and so on. So it's been uh, with us uh, since the realizations and it's very important, uh, 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 important uh, resources for us as a human to use uh, the medicinal plant or the natural product that available uh, for us for our own good. So next slide, please. Uh, as far as the uh, Malaysian medicinal plant is concerned, we are also as same as uh, the country around the world, especially in, in these regions. We uh, sit in the uh, mega biodiversity region, uh, including uh, Indonesia. And uh, we, uh, as, as we uh, see in the graph, we actually have seven more than 7% of the uh, of the total medicinal plant that have been identified, it could be many more, uh, but uh, judging from the size of the Malaysia compared to other country, uh, this uh, percentage is quite huge, um, and also uh, the number of the potential that has not been studied yet also huge, and uh, and in terms of the economy. Uh, uh, the herbal medicine, uh, as, as we can uh, expect, is going to increase uh, from uh, today to up to, we, we don't know how, uh, up to uh, more than, you know, in the future. And it, it, it will keep uh, increasing because we still have a lot more uh, resources from the, from the natural product and also from the medicine plant that has not been explored. Okay, next slide, please. So as for Malaysian, um, uh, the medicinal plants, uh, the research on medicinal plants uh, started as early as 1930. Uh, as you can see, there's uh, the first uh, uh, publications about uh, Malaysian medicinal plants comprehensively uh, is uh, the garden bulletins. Um, so uh, right now, uh, because of the deforestation uh, and over harvesting of the plant from the forest, we are seeing the lot of uh, uh, depleted in terms of number of plants and also the species. So in the university, in our university, we are putting together an effort for the medicinal plant conservations uh, by establishing the herbal garden and also the gym plaza in, in our university. So next slide, please. So this is what we uh, uh, what we've been doing right now. We are collecting all the herbs, all the herb medicinal plants around uh, the country, and we put together in the land, uh, in in our campus, and every uh, research about the medicinal plant in our university is centered in this. Uh, 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 gardens and uh, where the raw material can be found in here. All right. Next slide, please. All right. Um, as for our talk today, the, the medicinal plants uh, is not only focused on the uh, uh, the natural product. Sorry, the natural product is not only 
focus on the medicinal plants. We also have other uh, sources of natural products uh, that we work on. So, so in this uh, instance, we also work on the stingless bee where we can find a lot in our vicinity. And uh, the one that we interested is stingless bee from the uh, species that is um, that is bred for the commercial uh, purposes, especially for their honey. So as we know, the stingless bee uh, is very special because they collect the materials from the various plants. So where the secondary metabolites and even the, the primary metabolites that are collected has the purpose on its own for protection of their hive and so on. So uh, with this, uh, we uh, can exploit uh, uh, this material that collected by the bees for uh, to study and explore what are the potential. So today we are going to talk about the, the bees and also uh, this, 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 the, the medicinal plants that has the potential for the NTV blood. So next slide. Next slide, please. So the, the stingless bee has a, a diversity of, on its own uh, because we are in tropical, same as the medicinal plants, as a lot of um, um, and species and so on. So we need to screen a uh, uh, lot of species in order to find which one that we are going to focus on in terms of looking at the uh, biological activity and also the phytochemical aspect of it. Next. All right. So why uh, we are interested in, in, in venturing into study of uh, anti uterine fibroids? Um, as you can hear from the previous speaker, a lot of speakers talk about the study on diabetic, the study on anti-lipids uh, and so on. So we are uh, not focusing on the uterine fibroid because we found that there's a, there's a lack of a focus on this area and we can see the, the emerging of the cases uh, of the fibroid, especially uh, for the uterine fibroids. And, and uh, because of the diversity of the, uh, of the natural resources, of the natural products, uh, even from the medicinal plant and also from other sources, uh, maybe we can find that one or two species that, that have the uh, potential to be developed as a, um, a anti-uterine fibroid uh, botanical drugs. And then for this uh, study, for, for the purpose of the presentation today, I would like to focus on uh, three uh, species. Uh, two medicinal plant species, which is Autosiphon staminus. Uh, I think in Indonesia known as Kumis Kuching uh, and Labisia pumila. So we're known here in, uh, as a Kachit Fatima. So I do not know what is being called in Indonesia. And we're also going to uh, show a little bit of work that we done on stingless bee uh, propolis. Next slide, please. Right. So uh, we focus on uterine fibroid. There's a lot of fibroids, um, but we think that uh, uh, uterine fibroid has more uh, effect on, uh, on, on women and also the emerging of the cases that we uh, found uh, uh, nowadays, uh, probably due to uh, multiple reasons. Uh, the genetic, the, the diet, and so on. So we found that the cases are escalating, uh, especially here in Malaysia. Um, and it's also uh, going to be increased if uh, there is no intervention. So the intervention normally, uh, normally uh, by uh, uh, various means, uh, especially uh, by surgery. But we found that there's a study that uh, on the medicinal uh, plant, uh, especially uh, in the green tea, polyphenol, that is shown has a potential to, um, uh, to, uh, to be used 
as uh, the manage as to manage the uterine fibroid. So mean the, the they can uh, make the fibroid getting smaller and easy to get rid of. So we think that with this uh, evidence, uh, with this uh, report, so we probably can explore more on other medicinal plants as well. Okay, next slide, please. Right, so uh, we focus on these this three uh, natural products. So the first one is autosiphon staminus or kumis kuching. Uh, so this is, I think, a very famous plant. Uh, you, uh, you, you can just Google it. There's a lot of work on the autosiphon staminus. Uh, there's a lot of biological activities. There's also a very extensive autochemical uh, study in this plant. Uh, but uh, as we found out that, that there's, there's no work on the uh, fibroids. And, and uh, for the Lavisia pumila, so this plant is used uh, in Malaysia uh, in particular, used for women uh, herbs, especially after giving birth. So we found that maybe there is coloration, uh, uh, correlation between uh, the fibroid management and also uh, this plant because it probably affect the same type of hormones. Uh, then and this plant also uh, uh, is well studied uh, in Malaysia. Uh, there's no average activities being reported, and the uh, um, chemical analysis also been uh, fairly uh, uh, published. Um, and uh, the last one is the stingless bee. So for the stingless bee, we use propolis. Because the propolis is the material that collected by the bees from uh, various plants to uh, construct their, their hives, their home. So this material contains a lot of secondary metabolites. And we uh, found that when we do the phytochemical screenings, we found a very, very interesting uh, chemical profiles for uh, the propolis. So that's why we are thinking of exploring more on these uh, materials as a primary source of uh, natural products. Okay, next slide, please. Right. So the first thing that we did uh, for this, we use uh, uh, cell lines, uh, SKUT1. This is a, a uterine fibroid. Uh, cancer cell lines is malignant cancer cell lines uh, as a model for the in, for the in vitro analysis. So uh, we uh, uh, screen for the cytotoxicity uh, properties whether uh, these uh, uh, materials have uh, the cytotoxic activity, which is the um, which is the basic uh, basic. Uh, uh, data that we need to have. So we found that uh, after screening, um, th there is uh, some activities uh, that we can see uh, upon various uh, extraction methods that we use. And uh, for the sinus B, we also screen on the various species. Uh, so we found that uh, there's, a spe there's a two species that is very good uh, in terms of cytotoxicity properties. So next slide, please. And then uh, for for the uh, um, for the anti cancer cytotoxicity uh, is also uh, very basic to look at into the uh, the mode of cell death caused by these uh, extracts. So we found that's very interestingly some of the um, uh, extracts. Uh, managed to uh, have the uh, anti apoptotic uh, properties where uh, it shows that it can be uh, looked into uh, uh, or explore more on the effect of them uh, in, in uh, uh, cell death, especially in this type of uh, cells. So next slide. So this is for autosiphon staminus. We also do it for the uh, Labisia pumila. Uh, you can see uh, in the comparison uh, with uh, various time base and also various concentrations. Um, and we, co we conclude that there is a good um, data baseline uh, for us to explore more on uh, the effect of, the, of this extract uh, on the apoptosis of this uh, cell line. So next slide, please. 
So this one is for the stainless beads. As, as you can see, there, there are also uh, good um, um, property uh, in the stainless beads, but it's a um, 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 concentration dependent manner, uh, also time dependent manner. Right, next slide, please. Right. So the next one, what we uh, what we uh, uh, done is that we look into the effect of the apoptotic and also the inflammation uh, related proteins, where we think that have a very uh, good correlation with the pathway that involve in the cell death. So this one we uh, do we uh, here I show you. I will show you uh, the result that we have for the um, autosiphon and also uh, for the Labisia. So next slide, please. As you can see, there's a various uh, protein that we tested. We tested for PARP, uh, KP, uh, and also various proteins that is involved in the apoptotics and also in anti-inflammatory. So for the uh, autosiphon staminas, uh, we can see there is an effect more on the apoptotic. Uh, related proteins uh, compared to the inflammation proteins. So next one, please. And uh, for the autosiphon, we also um, uh, do in vivo uh, uterine fibroid xenograph uh, in the ethnic uh, model mouse. So we found that uh, in the dose-dependent manner, uh, the fibroid uh, is uh, affected effectively uh, shrunk uh, upon the, uh, the treatment with the autosiphon staminus. So uh, this is uh, giving us indications uh, that we should uh, explore more on, on this, um, uh, this property of the autosiphons, where it has a highly potential to be uh, studied more, especially uh, involving more animal studies. So next slide, please. The same thing that we found uh, in the Labisia pumila. So we also can see that the, there is a an, an huge effect on the, uh, the size of the tumor that we planted uh, in the mouse, uh, where, it get, where it shrunk. And it also, again, uh, it also uh, follow the same manner as the dose dependent manner. Uh, so this also gives us indication that we should uh, explore more on this potential for uh, both of uh, these plant species. The next slide, please. Right. So uh, as a summary, uh, we found that uh, the excess of uh, both plant, Persephone staminus and also Labisia pumula together with uh, the propolis uh, show a various degree of potential toward uh, uterine malignant cells and the effect differently to the molecular markers. So from this data, we know that we uh, can explore more, especially on the uh, well-designed pharmacological and pharmacokinetic study uh, to really see uh, to what extent the potential of these uh, extracts uh, of this uh, natural product on the fibroid tumors and potentially uh, develop a new uh, botanical drugs or a new drugs for the uh, uterine fibrots. All right, next slide, please. So uh, I acknowledge uh, the work that we've done is uh, supported by Ministry of uh, Agriculture and Food Industry and also our Ministry of Higher Education. Next slide, please. And uh, we also welcome you all to our faculty in Malaysia. So uh, with that, thank you very much for your attention. So hopefully uh, I get a few questions for you if you are interested. So next slide, next slide, please. All right. So this is our faculty and uh, looking forward to have collaborators to work with us, especially in the medicinal plant and also in Silex So thank you very much. Wow, thank you very much for Professor Dr. Kamsa Suryati, who have who has just presented about natural products as anti-uterine fibrils. 
in the presentation, we also listened about the natural product itself and also Malaysian medical plants that also mentioned. And we also listened about the diversity of the stingless bee and the result of the, 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 the paper of the presentation. Without wasting time, because we only have 23 minutes for discussion session before we take a break. I think we open for the first session. If any one of you here want to ask the question, but don't forget to mention your name first, your institution, to whom you want to ask the question and the question itself. I would like to open the question first for the three people or for three persons who want to ask the questions. Okay. The, the first question. First of all, thank you all for wonderful presentations. Uh, I'm very interested um, in the uh, wonderful high potential fruits, which are really unknown to the world, which Professor Sinaga, Samusuddin, and Sokara have talked about somewhat. So my question is, how many of those wonderful fruits have been actually domesticated and are grown and cultivated in agricultural systems rather than wildcrafted and collected from the wild? Are there any efforts to domesticate them and cultivate them? Well, okay. Um, to whom you want to deliver the question? To the all speakers? Um, yes, maybe Professor Sanaga can answer that because she presented us with greatest majority of this wonderful fruit. Okay, um, maybe the committee, because maybe the sun is not really clear because um, I'm also not listening it clearly and also the speaker not listening it clearly the question. Maybe just the committee, could you just raise up the volume of the microphone and could you just please repeat the question clearly? Okay, it's more clear, I think. Well, okay, well, we get the question. Before um, Professor Sinega answered the question, I just want to collect the question first. I think I will open for two more questions and I will give the opportunity for the speakers to answer the questions. Okay, the second question. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. My name is David. I'm from Universitas Nasional in Agriculture. Uh, I want to ask for, I'm sorry, who's, who's the last uh, the last speakers? I forgot the name. To Prof. Seidberg, you mean? Okay. Uh, I want to ask, how about regulation in Malaysia to control the usage of the rare plants that can be used as the herbal uh, herbal medicines. Is there any any regulation or any uh, control to usage of the or those the rare plants, which we know there's <coughs> no, but not all the plants can be breed. There's a uh, rare plants. So how can to control that? Thank you. Well, okay, I just want to make it clear that your question yes. is to Prof Kamsha or? Yes, Prof Kamsha. Prof Kamsha, right? Because yeah, yeah, okay. I just want to make sure that Prof Kamsha, you already got the question? Yes, I did. 
it's clear okay because because the sound here is not really clear so i just want to make sure that um the speaker who coming online already listen or uh, get the point of the question yes. before i give the thank you very much for the question and before i give the opportunity to to the speakers i just want to give one more opportunity one more question okay Okay, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I want to ask to for Prof. Shamsuddin. Um, from where you are? From I'm Bunga Anggren Sari uh, from Universitas Sriwijaya and uh, member CBCD2. Uh, for Prof. Sham, I want to ask uh, what I heard your search is to combine several plants, several plants to make a product, uh, namely Onobiat. Can you explain how the process is and how long to the research process take briefly? Thank you. Uh, sorry, if you are, if you, if you will ask me in Bahasa Indonesia, okay? Oh. Yeah. Oh, you know. <laughs> Dari yang saya dengar, Prof, uh, penelitian Prof tadi kan uh, menggabungkan beberapa tumbuhan untuk menjadikannya sebuah produk. Uh, saya ingin menanyakan uh, bagaimana prosesnya bisa menjadikan beberapa produk, beberapa tumbuhan itu menjadi uh, sebuah produk, dan berapa lama prosesnya uh, boleh secara singkat saja buat di sharing. Terima kasih, Prof. Oke, okay, maybe for the last um, for the last. Uh, person who asks the question, maybe you just come to the stage here, so we can listen it clearly. Because I think uh, the problem is in the sound. So we we here we are in the stage here. We can't listen the question very clear. So maybe for you, for the last questioner, could you just come to the stage and just give the question directly, so we can listen it clearly. Datang ke depan aja bu. Karena sepertinya we, we have a, we have a little bit problem with the sounds. Just coming because because I think the problem is from the speakers. Right. I'm just just coming come in. Okay. Yep. Sinaja. Just yeah just Sinaja. okay. Just coming. That yeah ke depan sini. Oh. Di sini bisa, ya langsung aja. Di sini nanya dari dari sini. Iya. Cek. Oke. Okay. Thank you very much for the to, to be honor for give the kesempatan untuk bertanya. Uh, my name is Tamir Jon Akbar from the Universitas Nasional. So it's clear. I think it's better you don't use the microphone. It's just coming to the stage. Just speak directly to your question. It's okay. Just, just yeah, yeah. You, you just ask here. I think it's quite clear. Okay, thank you. My name is Tamir John Akbar. I'm from uh, Universitas Nasional in here. Um, actually, I want to ask to the speakers, to all speakers in here, um, what are different things about these products, actually, for the specialty of medicine products in here, with another products, actually, uh, with another uh, medicine products. Um, just, just that, I want to ask the question. Thank you. Um, specifics. Um, who's the one that's aja yang mau aja? Maksudnya, uh, okay. 
Ya, uh, ini khususnya untuk terlebih kepada uh, narasumber yang ingin menjawab aja. Jadi saya untuk bertanya apa yang membedakan tentang uh, produk kesehatan ini dengan produk-produk uh, yang lain. Uh, ya, apa yang membedakan? Ya, seperti itu bu. Ya, oke, okay, sama-sama ibu. Terima kasih. Well, oke, okay. uh, we have four question and I think we still we still need we still need make it clear for the third question from the woman who asked the question i think could yeah yeah uh, oh well okay uh, our speakers already know the question so i think we will give the opportunity to the speakers who want to answer the question because um prof sinaga got the question from Prof. Ilya Raskin, do you want to answer the question first? Okay. Thank you very much, Ilya, for the question. Even though I cannot hear it uh, clearly. If I'm not mistaken, you asked about how many, how much will we, uh, how much we take the, the plan from the wild. Is that true? Okay. Actually, the plant and the fruit is uh, actually is uh, still much in the wild. Although they are not cultivated, but it's uh, still much in the wild. Uh, so we can uh, take the fruits as much as we need. We don't need to, I, I, I think we don't need to limit the the just just take what how much we need because the fruit is still much in the wild and uh, if the fruit is the seasonal fruits so it it means that we have to wait for the season to take the fruits but it's still much just like bidara for example in sumbawa it's a, a seasonal fruits whenever it's not it's season there are no fruits there are no bitter fruits but when uh, the season is come so so many many uh, bidara in the wild so we can take it as much as we need because if we didn't take it the local people they use it very very minimal so it will be it will be, it will be waste if you cannot take it so i think it's not it's not a rare fruit actually thank you very much well okay coming directly to the next question yeah uh, thank you very much for the question when i was in the indonesian institute of sciences i actually posted as the deputy chair for life sciences for two periods. So we are actually having uh, four botanical garden as an ex situ conservation. Lately, we built another 20 botanical garden in many parts of Indonesia. The problem is actually we are to concentrate on conservation, exit to conservation. But what happening, like for example, in Bogor Botanica Garden, we believe that we are, we, our collection is actually have two, two types. The first one is has a conservation value, and the second one has an economic value. The problem, we are actually uh, still in the conservation uh, uh, side, you know. but the uh, domestication of, especially of the economic value plan, is not actually there. So I, I, I during my my time uh, last uh, ten years, for example. I actually would like to have an activities to 
domesticate to to search the the functional things there, you know. So the tech collection is has a, a value, like what actually highlighted by CBD, the conservation. But the most important thing is sustainable use. And if possible, we can get also the reward, the economic benefit from that one. It is not really there, I think. Maybe it's also happening in many parts of the world. The, our understanding about the plant species, for example, like Propilas mentioned this morning, is very far away. So I actually do not really know about the biodiversity itself, about the plant species. Uh, barcoding is not really started, you know. The sequencing is not really, really, really there. You know? So cooperation with the developed countries, I think, is very much necessary. Thank you very much, Professor. Okay, maybe next um, to the question to Prof. Sham from Bunga. Yeah, uh, terima kasih. I answer in Bahasa Indonesia. Yeah. Jadi penelitian yang saya lakukan itu sebetulnya sudah jala, uh, sudah lama ya. Jadi dari mulai 2016 kami mulai untuk mengeksplorasi tumbuh-tumbuhan yang digunakan sebagai anti diabetes. Jadi kami menggunakan esai alpha glikosidase. Jadi uh, sudah dari 2016, kemudian sampai sekarang pun masih dilakukan oleh masuk beberapa mahasiswa S3. Kemudian untuk menjadikan suatu produk itu mulai tahun 2018, 2018, 2019. Karena ada dana itu ada dana riset dari Insinas selama dua tahun. Jadi kami sudah mulai uh, melakukan uh, apa kombinasi poliherbal karena memang yang untuk dijual ke pasaran itu memang lebih market itu lebih percaya pada poliherbal dibandingkan single produk. Jadi kami menggunakan uh, poliherbal. Jadi untuk poliherbal sampai membuat suatu produk uh, poliherbal itu dari 2019 karena ada dana riset dari Insinas sampai 2021. Jadi 2021 itu sudah kami lakukan penelitiannya uh, berikut uh, preklinikal maupun uh, uh, farmakologinya. Jadi sampai Patennya juga sudah kami sudah kami daftarkan dan juga sudah sudah terregistrasi. Jadi karena itu luaran yang diminta oleh Insinas itu ada produk yang hilirisasi. Mungkin itu bisa menjawab pertanyaan. Terima kasih. Well, maybe the last question which will be answered by Professor Kamsa. Okay. Uh, so thank you for the questions. So I think the question is about the regulation of the uh, the the usage of the plant in Malaysia, if I get question right, and also the regulation pertaining of the the use uh, or the extraction of the raw plant from the forest. Uh, I think I got the question right. So uh, to answer this question, yes, we do have the specific regulation. Uh, for the um, uh, for the use of the medicinal plant from the wild, as we can see that um, um, forest in Malaysia is not as big as uh, as in Indonesia, as in Thailand, as in Vietnam, and so on. So we also have a very big industrial crop. Uh, such as palm oil, rubber trees, and so on. So uh, the government is put in place a, a few regulations uh, for the extraction of the plant species uh, from the forest. Uh, for example, if you uh, want to uh, sample the plant uh, to do the research, uh, even in biodiversity or for the medicinal uh, properties analysis and so on, you need to have a permit uh, to um, uh, to go into the forest and collect the plants. And, and if you uh, want to do your work in Borneo, so, so Malaysia have two states in Borneo, Sarawak and Sabah, uh, that uh, the, the, the plant species in Borneo cannot be brought in, 
in, into the peninsula of Malaysia. So uh, there's a very strict regulation on that unless we can get a permit uh, to bring the plant from the Borneo to the peninsula and also to take the plant from the forest. So the department that is uh, responsible for this regulation is the Department of Forestry and uh, also for the uh, development of the products um, uh, from the medicinal plants uh, to be used by the public is also regulated uh, by the Pharmaceutical Bureau uh, under the Ministry of Health uh, of Malaysia. And uh, for the uh, uh, biodiversity of the plants uh, in Malaysia, is also regulated by the Ministry of uh, Natural Resources uh, in Malaysia. So there is a special website that is dedicated uh, to the uh, Malaysian uh, biodiversity. So there is a, also the apps uh, that we can use um, if we want to work on the plants. It's called MyBIS, uh, Malaysian Biodiversity uh, Repository. Uh, we should refer to this uh, repository if we want to work on any plants and get the permit to get the plant extract. Right, so uh, this looks complicated, but if we want to use just a, uh, just a plant that is really available uh, in uh, the, in our, like the, in our district and it's not protected under the, I mean, it's under the Department of Forestry. So we just uh, need to have uh, the committee approval from the university. Uh, so our university have the ethic committee uh, for uh, animal and plants. Um, it's not, it's, it's, it's like the same as the human ethic committee for, for the clinical trial. So if you want to publish any uh, paper pertaining uh, to the species that especially endemic to Malaysia, uh, you need to have the approval from this committee. Okay, so I think I answered the questions. Well, that's all. I think it's answer the question. Um, we st thank, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Prof. Kamsa. And I think we still have one more question who, which has not been answered. It is the question from Jonathan from Universitas Nacional. And I think because the question regarding the products, we will give the first opportunity to Prof. Sham to answer the question. Ya, jadi perbedaan antara produk obat tradisional itu ada tiga bentuk di Indonesia. Yang pertama adalah jamu. Yang kedua obat herbal terstandar. Yang ketiga fitoparmaka. Nah perbedaannya kalau jamu itu tidak memenuhi, tidak harus memenuhi persyaratan eh, apa namanya pengujian preklinik. Jadi hanya berdasarkan pengobatan empiris, kemudian syaratnya itu harus eh, bersih ya, kemudian juga harus eh, aman. Kemudian yang kedua adalah obat herbal terstandar. Jadi obat herbal terstandar itu persyaratannya lebih ketat dibandingkan jamu. Ya, yang pertama harus eh, apa namanya? harus sudah dilakukan pengujian, pengujian preklinik. Jadi preklinik itu baik pengujian farmakodinamik maupun pengujian toksisitas. Jadi pasti diminta kalau untuk persyaratan ke BPOM, itu adalah kita kalau kita registrasi ke BPOM, itu diminta formulir PPUPK. Jadi PPUPK itu berisi mengenai metode-metode yang digunakan baik secara eksperimental maupun secara uh, preklinik yang lain. Jadi persyaratan memang itu, ada uji preklinik. Kemudian yang ketiga, fitoparmaka. Persyaratannya lebih ketat dibandingkan obat herbal terstandar. Karena selain harus standarisasi, kemudian juga fitoparmaka harus ada uji klinisnya. Jadi itu perbedaan antara ketiga bentuk uh, herbal medicine yang ada di Indonesia. Terima kasih. Well, okay. Thank you very much, Prof. Syam. Uh, maybe any speakers want to add, or it's already enough? Maybe I can add a little bit more. Uh, oh, okay. Of Malaysian. Uh, so I think um, in terms of Malaysian, uh, it's just the same as uh, uh, Prof. Uh, Sam uh, just now. Uh, so we also have these three kind of products. Uh, 
uh, so the natural products can be uh, uh, can be used as a supplement uh, can be uh, can be used as a botanical drug with the standardized um, uh, with the standardized materials and also the pharmaceutical uh, the, the actual pharmaceutical products so all these products that have a different regulations. Uh, for the supplement, uh, we only need to have the claims that is um, is already established. Uh, just for example, we we may know uh, we we known that this uh, product, for example, kumis kucing, is already known for like a uh, few years and been used uh, from the nineties or forties. And it's as it established that the, the toxicity is non-existing or very minimal, so it can use as a supplement, and we can get the uh, the the uh, license for the to be used as a supplement. And for the standardized uh, botanical drugs, uh, we need to have the preclinical and clinical data, uh, so that uh, you uh, so that we can have the permit for the uh, standardized uh, herbal products and uh, for the uh, pharmaceutical drugs uh, from the natural products is uh, the regulation is the same as the conventional drugs so it needs to has need to has the clinical uh, try need to have the various and very uh, stringent um, regulation and testing and uh, including the toxicity test so all the products uh, have to have the toxicity test. That's the basic of all. So, uh, in terms of uh, whether there's a difference between uh, herbal and non-herbal, so I think in terms of regulations, uh, they are almost the same. It's just that the pharmaceutical one uh, is more strict uh, than uh, the herbal one. The herbal one, you just need the toxicity. And if you want to just use as a supplement, is uh, the re the regulation is more relaxed compared to the one that you want to declare as a drugs per se. Um, in terms of preference of the consumers, uh, if we use term uh, botanical drug or we use term natural products, the acceptance to certain people is small because the sometimes assume that natural product is more safe, even though uh, sometimes it's not the case. That's why we need the toxicity test and all those uh, kind of preclinical and clinical data to support. Uh, so to answer your questions, what is the difference? I think for the consumer is their preference, whether they want to use the botanical drug or natural product or herbal or traditional obatan, uh, ramai yang uh, beranggapan uh, obatan tradisional itu lebih selamat walaupun uh, dia sebenarnya uh, tidak sebegitulah uh, so, jadi in terms of regulation dia lebih kurang saja so itu saja yang saya boleh respon lah. well ok thank you very much I think the answer is very clear and I think I don't need to conclude all of the presentation and don't need to conclude all of the answer because I think I already conclude for each presentation after the presenter uh, give the presentation. And once more, before we end this uh, forum, I mean this, this, this session, and before I give it back to the MC, I would like to say thank you very much once again to Prof. Ernawati, to Prof. Shamsuddin, to Prof. Endang Sukara, Endang Sukara to Prof. Seidberg, and to Prof. Kamsa. Please give applause. Well, okay, I think I'll give it back to the MC. Mr. Fadlan, ladies and gentlemen, the next agenda is award given to keynote speaker, Prof. Ilya by Prof. Ernawati Sinaga, and also given to invited speaker by organizing committee, Dr. Nanan Saribanon, and head of biology study program, Dr. Tatang Mitra Setia. Please take the floor.
And for online keynote speakers, sorry, repeat. For online speakers, uh, the award will be sent to you. And then ladies and gentlemen, now we come to end of this opening ceremony of the first international conference on natural products and chronic disease 2022. On behalf of the host and committee, we would like to extend once again our deepest appreciation to you for all your support in participant. We wish you have a safe journey. And I would like to remind the next agenda is conference session. For the conferences, the, for the conversation room will be divided into three. For the participant in room one, please join seminar at auditorium. And for room N2 and three, please join seminar at class 103 and 104. Thank you and good afternoon. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Ladies and gentlemen, are welcome to enjoy the available music. Go! Cool. 